The first week after Christmas vacation, Sam brought a note home from school. His class was going on a field trip. They're going to spend an afternoon at the Matisse exhibit at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Sam needed his mother or father to sign his permission form. Now getting something like this signed is a lot trickier than it sounds. The kid doesn't do this sort of thing without careful thought. First about who they're going to take it to, and second about when they're going to present it. <laughs> Sam took his note to his mother, waited until she was on the phone. <laughs> Just don't want to give them a chance to ask questions didn't take the note to his father because Sam has learned that when Dave hears about field trips, wants to go. <laughs> By the time you're in grade five having your father on a field trip, that's the last thing you want. Unfortunately for Sam, Dave's job has always afforded him the flexibility of being available for this sort of thing. For two years, Dave ran pizza lunch at Sam's school which was actually a great thing for Sam. When you're in grade two, you get a lot of status when your friends learn your dad delivers pizza. <laughs> well, why couldn't you get a job like that, said Sam's friend Ben to his father one night. What do lawyers do anyway? <laughs> now, because of his availability, Dave has had more experience than many of his friends of squiring kids around. He's done birthday parties and sleepovers. He's coached baseball and hockey, and he's done field trips. Field trips have never been his strongest suit. Dave only got to go on one school trip when he was a boy, grade five. It was one of the greatest disappointments of his young life. Every other grade five before and after Dave's class at Big Narrows Elementary School in Big Narrows Cape Breton was taken to Doris Eckerley's Brick Apron Bakery on Main Street for their field trip. <laughs> and not just to the front of the bakery where you went to buy stuff, but right into the back where they baked it. The grade fives went there every year. And when they came back to school, they brought back horrifying stories about the back of the bakery. <laughs> stories that would curdle your blood especially if you happen to be in grade two. <laughs> the grade twos would listen to the stories at recess and many of them would start to weep because they knew that one year they would have to go to the back of the bakery. <laughs> and when they went there, they would meet Chopsy, the one-eyed baker, <laughs> who never shaved and chewed foul-smelling cigar butts and breathe fish breath on you and stared at you with one bulging infected yellow eye. <laughs> All the kids knew the story of Chopsy. Chopsy had been a cook during the war and the soldiers in Chopsy's unit were fearless because they were so well fed. They'd do anything as long as they knew they could get back for supper every night because Chopsy was the greatest chef in the entire army. And then one day, Chopsy's unit was cut off from their supply lines. They were trapped in this town by the enemy, and as the days went by, the generals came to Chopsy and they said, we're doomed unless you can do something. They were running out of food. And anyone would have given up, anyone else would have given up, but not Chopsy. Chopsy sneaked into the sewers at night in this town, wherever they were. It was like in Poland or Saskatchewan or something. And Chopsy would hunt for rats in the sewer, and every morning before dawn, he'd return with a bag full of writhing rats. And because they were short on ammo, he had to use his carving knife to kill the rats. And that's how he got his nickname. And he cooked those rats so incredibly that none of the men had any idea they were eating rats. Chopsy told them it was quail. <laughs> and they all survived, except Chopsy went crazy which was why he was living in Cape Breton. <laughs> but the most horrible thing was that Chopsy had developed a taste for rats, and he raised them in a secret room in the back of the bakery. <laughs> and the rats ate children. <laughs> and that's why they had the tours. <laughs> because Chopsy needed children to feed the rats. 
And there were kid traps in the back of the bakery. There were vats of whipped cream back there that were just traps for kids. Boys wandered into those vats of whipped cream and they're never seen again. Vanished. And it didn't take a genius to figure out what had happened to them. Chopsy. Parents wouldn't talk about this because parents didn't want kids getting worried. But everyone knew that's what happened to Chan Gillespie. The growing up said that Chan had gone to boarding school in New Brunswick, but Joey Tallarico's older brother, Michael, found one of Chan Gillespie's hairs in a chocolate eclair. <laughs> and he kept it in a jar in his locker. And for five cents, he'd open his locker and show the hair, do you? And for a dime, he'd let you hold the jar. Dave and Billy Mitchell had been looking forward to their trip to the bakery since grade three. They had a plan. They were going to take Dave's younger sister, Annie, with them, <laughs> who was in kindergarten. And they figured if Chopsy came after them, they'd offer Annie in their place. And then they were going to dump Billy's marble collection into the mixing machine the machine that mixed the cake dough, see if they could get real marble cake. <laughs> but they didn't go to the bakery that year. They went to the sardine plant. <laughs> sardine plant's no longer operating in Big Narrows. It was closed in 1961. After a Norwegian sardine expert came to the Narrows and told them they had to change the way they were packing the sardines. They used to put the sardines into the can in two rows with their tails resting at either end and their little sardine snouts meeting in the middle of the cans. And the guy from Norway came to town, told them they should put the tails in the middle and the snouts at the ends. Said the tails were flipping out of the cans from time to time and they weren't sealing properly. The women in the Big Narrows plant took this as a personal insult. We've been packing sardines this way for 22 years, said Norma Cavanaugh when she heard about the proposal, and I ain't changing. No way Tails is coming out, said Nance McDougall. Plant closed soon after that. Before it closed, they had begun to pack them tail in, but it was too late. Anyway, Dave and Billy had to go to the sardine plant the year they were in grade five. Dave still can't open a tin of sardines without checking for marbles. That was it for field trips. Dave didn't go on another school trip for 30 years until Sam was in grade two, which was before Sam had figured out who he should take his notices to when they needed to be signed. They went to the zoo. Dave was given a group of, well, that was the problem. By the time they got to the hippo paddock, Dave couldn't remember how many kids he was supposed to have in his group. <laughs> He knew six was part of the equation, but he couldn't remember if it was Sam plus five made six or Sam plus six made seven, which wasn't such a big deal right then, but could be at the end of the day. <laughs> it wasn't important at the hippo paddock because one of the six or seven, at this point, as I say, the numbers weren't that important because one of Dave's kids, a kid called Mark Portner, had somehow scaled the concrete wall surrounding the paddock and was marching back and forth along the top of the wall screaming, come and get me! <laughs> and one of the hippos, an animal about the size of a bus, seemed to be thinking it over. <laughs> D Dave got Mark Portner off the wall, which was harder than it sounds. And he said, is everyone here? And everyone said yes, and Dave counted them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then he said, hey, to the kid in the Montreal Canadian hockey sweater who was walking away from the group, what's your name? And that's George, said Mark Portner. He's in my Hebrew class. And Dave said, okay, George, let's go. And George looked at Mark and Mark said, come on. And Dave, whose patience was growing thin, said, I don't want to hear another word out of anyone. Come on, said Mark Portner. How was Dave to know that Hebrew school was all that George and Mark had in common? 
How was Dave to know that George was at the zoo with his mother? <laughs> How was Dave to know that when he said, okay, George, let's go, that George's mother was standing not 10 yards away with her back turned to them, tending to George's younger brother? How was Dave to know that when she turned around and found George, her son, had vanished, George's mother would lodge a frantic report with zoo officials and spend the next three tearful hours waiting in the administrative building? <laughs> Unless someone told him this, how was Dave to know? All he knew was that at two o'clock when they got to the bus, George said, my mom's gonna be mad if I get on that bus. <laughs> And Dave looked at him and said, I'm going to be madder if you don't. <laughs> and George started to cry and Mark Portner said, come on. <laughs> and George looked at Mark and then he looked at Dave and he shook his head and he said, you're going to be sorry. <laughs> and then he got on the bus with his head hanging down. And it was only when they got back to the school and all the parents had come and picked up their children and the only three people left in the schoolyard were Dave and the school principal and George standing between them weeping that the enormity of what had happened settled on Dave. D Dave eventually got wind of the trip to the Matisse exhibit. You know why I've always liked Matisse, said Dave at supper. Sam shook his head. Because, said Dave, putting down his fork, a collector once asked Matisse how long it took to paint some incredibly expensive piece that consisted of just a few breezy lines. And do you know what Matisse said? He said, it took a lifetime. I don't get it, said Sam. You will, said Dave. They were still looking for parents to go on the trip to the art gallery. It's your big chance to redeem yourself, said Morley. Dave signed up to go. And so did his neighborhood nemesis, Mary Turlington. As soon as Dave saw Mary Turlington standing at the back of the classroom on the day of the trip, all of his confidence evaporated. Mary was holding a clipboard <laughs> and a neat pile of name tags for each kid in her group. Hello, David, she said when she saw him. Hi, said Dave. Where do I get the labels? I made them at home, said Mary archly. <laughs> there were five boys, including Sam and Dave's group. Five, said Dave, smiling confidently at Sam's teacher as they were getting ready. Five, he repeated earnestly to himself. <laughs> one for each finger. <laughs> when no one was looking, he took a ballpoint pen and he wrote the number five in ink on the back of his wrist. He looked across the room. Mary Turlington had her group sitting in a circle. She was filling out name tags. Five, said Dave. Five would be easy. As it turned out, one of Dave's five was late for school that Tuesday. They just phoned, said Sam's teacher. They're on their way. Go, said Dave. You go. We'll catch up. We'll meet you at the museum. They were traveling by subway. Be careful, whispered Dave to Grace Weed as she led her group out of the classroom. There's a guy in the basement of the museum who's crazy. <laughs> what, said Grace, not sure if Dave was serious or not. His name is Chopsy, said Dave. <laughs> I'd watch the kids very carefully if I were you. The guy's as crazy as a loon. By the time they got to the subway, Dave felt like he was a sheepdog. His boys, they all seemed nice enough. They were wound up like seven-day clocks. Keeping these boys together took his full attention. Two of them tried to slip into a corner store to buy candy. No candy, said Dave. At the first intersection, three went one way and two another. Same thing at the next. And then they all wanted pizza. No pizza, said Dave. No pizza now, no pizza later. We're going to a museum. We're going to see art. We're not going for pizza. Felt like he was in a giant game of snakes and ladders. 
just as long as he kept everyone in sight, just as long as he returned with the same number he left with five, he said to himself again. Eventually, he chivvied his boys onto the eastbound subway platform. By the time the train arrived, he had them more or less circled. Door of the subway car opened. Wait, said Dave, holding them back a second. Okay, now. And the boys went, but Dave didn't go. He held back, counting the bodies as they got on the train. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Four boys, where was five? Dave looked around, there was five. Five was tying up his shoe. Come on, said Dave, looking nervously at the train. Coming, said number five, who hop slid onto the subway, doing his sneaker up at the same time. Dave sighed, all present and accounted for. Sir, took a look up and down the empty platform, and then he turned to get on the train himself, just in time to watch the doors slide shut in his face. leaving Dave on the platform and his five boys on the train, which was pulling out of the station. Wait at the next station, he shouted. Last thing he saw of his boys, they were shrugging and pointing at their ears. <laughs> Took four minutes for the next train to arrive. Four minutes during which Dave accepted Christ Jesus as his personal savior. <laughs> Please, Jesus, he said, make them get off at the next station and wait. When it finally arrived, Dave leapt onto the next train, but he didn't stop praying. He wasn't worried that the kids would fall to any harm. They were, after all, ten years old. There were, after all, five of them. It's just that they could get hopelessly lost, and if they got separated, he didn't even want to think of that. It is only a minute and a half ride between stations. Halfway there, Dave's train passed a train coming from where he was heading. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Dave pressed his face to the car window and saw what he didn't want to see. <laughs> Sam and his buddies pressed against their window and they were jumping up and down and waving at him. Why me, Lord, said Dave. <laughs> Dave didn't know what to do. He, should, should he go back again like the boys had? Were they waiting on the platform for him to appear? Or should he stay put? Someone had to stay put. What would they be thinking? Who knows what a 10-year-old thinks? Especially when there are five of them. Dave decided to wait. He waited for three trains. Nothing happened. Now he knew the boys were waiting for him, but he knew they knew he was waiting for them. He felt like his head was going to explode. It, it was a nightmare. He waited two more trains, and he ran to the other side of the track, and he headed back to the station where everything had started, and it was empty. Boys weren't there. They'd either gone back to school or gone to the museum, and now Dave felt trapped. He didn't want to alert the school if the kids hadn't. On the other hand, if, if the boys were waiting for him at school and he didn't phone, what would they think of him? He decided to make a precautionary call. When the school secretary answered, he said, Hi, it's Dave. I'm just checking in, just making sure everything's all right. Everything's okay said the secretary. She sounded doubtful. Good, said Dave. Everything's okay here, too. That was pretty strange, said the secretary when she hung up. And then, because he had no better idea, he got back on the subway. He headed for the museum. 
and then with a heavy heart he walked through the large brass front doors, went right for the cafeteria, nothing, went to the gift shop. First the gift shop looked empty too, and Dave was about to leave when he suddenly spotted Mark Portner, <laughs> the perennial troublemaker. Alone in the corner, he was supposed to be in Mary Turlington's group. Had his back to Dave, seemed to be holding something in his hands. Dave moved over an aisle to get a better view, and as soon as he did, he realized what Mark Portner was up to. The boy was about to slip whatever he was holding into his backpack. Dave knew he had to apprehend the boy. He had a split second to decide whether he did it before or after the theft. Didn't have time to mull over the repercussions of the two possibilities. Operating on instinct, he decided to give the boy a break. What do you have there, Mark? He said as he stepped around the corner of the aisle. I, I was just looking at it, said Mark. He was holding a little book. Dave took it from him, great masterpieces of the Western world daily affirmation book. <laughs> they went up to the museum office together and they found a hysterical Mary Turlington and the rest of her group. He was in the gift shop, said Dave. Thank you so much, said Mary. I, I just saw your group working on their sheets on the second floor. I wondered where you were. <laughs> How did you know we needed help? <laughs> oh, said Dave, you know, it's okay. He found Sam and the other boys in his group sitting in a circle in front of a painting of a woman in a pair of red gypsy pants and no top. <laughs> they were so absorbed in the painting, they didn't even notice him until he sat down. Sam looked at him and smiled. What took you, he said. Oh, said Dave, you know. They heard footsteps and they looked up together and they saw Mary Turlington heading toward them. Sam looked back at his dad in time to see his father's face drop. I was thinking, he said suddenly, a sly look crossing his face. Maybe on our way back to school we could stop for pizza. <laughs> Dave stared at his son in disbelief. I was just thinking, said Sam. Just in case anyone asks, he glanced at Mary Turlington, that you know everyone would have much happier memories if they were remembering things on a full stomach. <laughs> Thank you very much.